Hello, BookTube. Well, it's that most melancholy moment of the week. The last mail haul of the week. Burning hot packages from the front porch. Bright, red-faced mail carriers lugging all this stuff in 90-degree uh, weather with uh, humidity that's just been going up by the hour. <laughs> uh, so we have our last little mail shipment here of books, and then I'm, I have a clamorous <laughs> I have a clamorous miniature schnauzer. <laughs> Who really wants to go outside? I know. I know. Uh, her, <laughs> her desire to go outside is not at all a reflection of how long she, she's going to last out there. It's hot and humid out there. You're, you're not going to last long. You're, you want to go out for a mile-long walk, but you can't do it. Uh, well, I'm going to do it anyway. I'll indulge her until she can't do it anymore, and then I'll just carry her back. <laughs> but, uh, but before we do that, I thought we'd get the mail out of the way, uh, since this is the last time this week. And I, I, I'm glad that it's not that many packages. It's about ten books, uh, because I've got a huge amount of work to do this weekend. I'm chopping things down. I think what I will probably do is just take naps instead of sleeping until Monday night so that I can just maximize the time. If I if I am unconscious, <laughs> if I waste very little time, if I'm unconscious for only two hours out of the next 36, then I should be able to get everything done. And I'm happy to do it, too. I'm not acting like... The, I'm not trying to make it sound like it's a burden. It's a wonderful thing to have a whole day of writing in front of you. <laughs> Those of you who consider yourself writers and never write ought to try it sometime. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, let's see. Let's see what this first one is. Uh, what have we got? What have we got here? Good lord, what is this? Oh, oh, okay, all right, oh, let's see here. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> okay, this is, uh, this is a novel called Plum Belly, uh, by Gary Maynard. It's, uh, it's coming out, I imagine, next month. Uh, in this crisply, oh, it's a debut. In this crisply written debut novel, the author turns the classic escape under sail fantasy on its head. The dialogue is authentic. The scenes are richly but sparingly described, and the nautical details ring oh so true, which is a rarity in fiction. But in true Conrad fashion, Maynard has been to sea and to the real South Pacific, and from his experience, he paints a brilliant, discordant, and vulnerable picture of running away to sea and coming of age. So not. Omu and Taipei, or at least a counterpoint to Omu and Taipei. And the reason that I was that I was thrown at first is because this is under consideration for review at the at the the Mathers Vineyard Gazette. The Vineyard Gazette is where I, I do a lot of book reviewing. That's wonderful. That's why I didn't recognize it. Uh, so maybe the author is uh, has Vineyard connections. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I'm to read it and see what I make of it. So I will gladly do that. Oh, this next one is also the Vineyard Gazette. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so what is this? This is a hardcover. Uh, also the Vineyard Gazette. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, it's called Dear Jack by Barbara Bates Conroy and Jackson Scott Conroy. That's a painting on the cover. That's not bad at all. Uh, Dear Jack, Barbara writes to her son Jack. She always had, even before he was born, though through his troubled teenage years, when he struggled with drug addiction, and even after his death at age 21. Good Lord. Seemed the only thing to do. Keep writing to him. Keep trying to reach him. A high-powered working mother, Barbara gave her five children and husband a beautiful life, but even with all the money, resources, and caring in the world, she couldn't save her son from his battle with prescription drugs and heroin. Through his troubled years and after his death, Barbara's world is turned upside down as she moves through one of the greatest heartbreaks any parent could ever face. She's left devastated and wondering what happened to her loving, amazing, adorable Jack. Wow. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and the author lives on Arthur's Vineyard, so this is this is probably a debut work. Good Lord, that's going to be tough to read. Okay. All right. So that's another book under consideration for review. The Vineyard Gazette, Dear Jack, uh, a drug memoir, not the usual Vineyard fare. Uh, so let's. Let's move on from here. This this uh, mail hall of our last mail hall of the week ends in a box, so you never know. Oh goodness gracious! Oh okay, I've heard about this book. This comes out in late August, uh, and uh, huh? 
Okay, this is by William Giraldi. This is uh, American Audacity in Defense of Literary Daring. Uh, American Audacity is no mere assemblage of erudite essays, but an exuberant pan to the best and most brazen of American literature. For the past decade, the author has been writing book reviews and essays that take on every aspect of our country's literary tradition. So have I. I don't have a book. I should probably correct that, shouldn't I? Something self-published. Just like I can say, author of. Uh, that's a subject for another video. <laughs> uh, here he brings together his most spirited arguments and makes the case that stylistic boldness and intellectual daring should always be rewarded in our culture. As the author of two novels, Giraldi has often been accused of audaciousness in his book-length works, so it is no surprise that it, that it is a standard by which he holds others when writing from pulpits such as The New Republic, The New, Re New York Review of Books, Oxford American, and The Daily Beast. Over these three dozen Giraldi exam these three dozen essays, Giraldi examines the evolution, the future of American writing from a number of different angles, featuring canonical American writers James Baldwin, Cynthia Ozick, Harper Lee, Her <coughs> Herman Melville, but also the lesser sung Daniel Woodrell, Christian Wyman, Lauren Slater, Wendy Lesser. In praising audacity as a literary virtue, however, the author warns against the excesses of brazenness. The writing he values above all else is not simply there to shock. Writers need to uh, a rigorous respect for language. Wow, okay, so uh, that's fantastic. I, I've heard about this book. I've heard a couple of people uh, were dipping into it, and uh, one, one old reviewing friend of mine got an advanced copy of this. He got it considerably be uh, As a side note to the people of Liverite, he got it considerably before I did. Okay. Uh, but he... He emailed me and said, uh, it's, uh, collections like this will either do one of two things uh, to, in your mind about their author. You'll either read a bunch of their stuff collected in a book like this, and you'll say, boy, I don't know what the fuss was about. <laughs> or you'll read a bunch of their stuff collected like this, and you'll say, boy, they're even better than I remember. <laughs> he said that's the latter with this book. And I take that seriously when, when critical friends say things like that, uh, because people who... You know who get who get review copies in the mail all the time. They never shut that part of their mind off. They they just critically assess. There's no uh, there's no rareness factor. There's no surprise to blur their reactions. So I take that seriously. So this comes out in the, in the end of August, and I actually haven't read it. Didn't get an advance copy. Didn't get this copy until now. So that's great. Wow. All right. That uh, that goes right to the top of the list. Uh, let's see what this next one is. Oh boy, oh boy. Oh, this is turning out to be a great a great uh, haul here. This is the latest from John McPhee. This is The Patch. Look at that cover. Isn't that awesome? The puppy is chewing on a pillow. It's a protest to go outside. Uh, this is his 33rd book in which he brings together a range of writings divided into two sections. In the first, he collects six pieces on sports and the outdoors, beginning with an elegant essay about fishing for pickerel in New Hampshire, and concluding with his latest piece from The New Yorker, a charming story about the wild bear population of New Jersey. In between are pieces on football, lacrosse, laugh out loud funny of his penchant for collecting loft golf balls. <laughs> uh, and in the second section is called An American Quilt, the second section of this book. Uh, he's cut up and rearranged short snippets from an assortment of work spanning his career, stitching them back together to form a, whole, a new whole that careens playfully from topic to topic. Now see, I heard about that. I heard that that was going to be part of this, and I, I, my reaction when I heard about it months ago is the same as my reaction now. What I would like is for this author, or his editors, maybe with their help, uh, to do an, an album quilt as an enormous book, <laughs> not one half of one very small book. Instead, what I'd like is a 900-page John McPhee book called uh, An Album Quilt that does the exact same thing. Stitch together long and short things from your whole career with little, uh, with little reflections and new chronologies between them all and make it an actual book. Some of us have grown up reading your stuff, so do that. Don't do it for half of one small book. Do it for 900 pages. I... I would love that. Uh, well, I, gotta, I gotta hope that maybe that that suggestion will be made to the author. Uh, perhaps I will make that suggestion to the author. Uh, this come, anyway, this comes out in uh, in mid-November. 
Uh, so I have time before I get to it, although I might not. I might not hold off. Uh, let's see what the next one is. What is this? Hmm, okay. All right, this comes out in early October. Uh, uh, I did not request it. It's not from any publisher that I know. Is it from any publisher that you know, Frida? You're just, you're nosing into it like you want to review it yourself. Is that true? Do you want to review it yourself? <laughs> just settle down. I will be getting to you. Uh, so this is this is an advanced copy that I got. Uh, it's not anything to look at, uh, but the, the finished copy is going to look like that. The fat kid. Uh, and it is, uh, let's see here. Uh, born unto a father steeped in violence, the fat kid grows up tortured for his ever-expanding girth. As a young man, the fat kid tends bar while his friends and co-workers muddle about the drinkers, including the fat kid's own daddy. They are all subject to the influence of a mysterious blonde-haired and black-garbed stranger who comes and goes, known only as the man. Unbeknownst to all save the fat kid's daddy, who migrated across vast country with the man, experiencing savage murder, near starvation, and cannibalism, the fat kid and his friend's fates are sealed. In alternating narratives from the perspectives of the fat kid and his daddy, the story takes place in a vast country full of gray plains and towering rocky mountains, dusty deserts and shimmering lakes, a landscape beautifully at odds with the horror in the lives of those who live upon it. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, this is a novel. It's, uh, it's due in, uh, in early October. I haven't heard anything about it, but uh, but I'm intrigued because the the premise sounds quasi uh, mythological. Which is if you can pull that off, it's a it's a gambit that appeals to everybody. But most people can't pull it off. If you can, you can do wonders. With it, so I'll give it a try. Uh, so on we go. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Okay, I requested this. This is also going to be tough to read. This comes out in early November. It's called In Extremis, The Life and Death of War Correspondent uh, Marie Colvin. There she is in all her glory. Uh, that is a mind on which absolutely nothing is lost. Uh, the British journalist Lindsay Hilsom met Marie Colvin in 1998 while both were on assignment in, in uh, overseas. Their instant bond lasted until the end when Colvin was killed by an IED in Holmes, Syria in 2012. Everyone knew of Colvin's badass demeanor and unflappable courage, as she reported from the world's most treacherous war zones, but after her death, the author realized that there was as much she did not know about her friend and colleague. This new book, In Extremis, is a thrilling and powerful investigation into Colvin's epic life and tragic death. Everybody else's dog behaves. <laughs> Uh, in Extremis is the story of how a girl born in the late 1950s in Queens, brought up in a suburban Long Island, became uh, celebrated in Britain and across the world for the most daring war reportage of her age. Through previously unseen diaries and interviews with lovers, friends, colleagues, and others, the author reveals a complex, driven woman whose concern for the victims of war was such that she regularly risked her life to witness their suffering. Uh, and that, that's absolutely true. Uh, <laughs> Marie Colvin knew no fear. The only thing she was really afraid of is the thing she avoided. She talked about avoiding it all the time. <laughs> uh, of course, in the moment, with bullets flying or whatnot, or, or stone teenagers waving guns around, she could be momentarily frightened. But the only thing she was systematically, seriously afraid of was uh, debilitation. It was withering. It was lessening. Uh, and she avoided that. Not not entirely in the way that I would pick, but uh, but it's a choice that comes to everybody. You get to a certain point. You've lived your life in a certain way. That's the thing you don't want, is to be a husk in a care home somewhere where people might remember you 
the way you were, but you don't remember yourself that way anymore, and you'll never be that way again, but you still have 20 more years of, of eating pureed food. <laughs> I know there's a lot of love that goes into the support of such people, but there are, there are those of us who do not want to end that way. <laughs> and, uh, and she didn't, and, and uh, that adds an extra element of uh, poignancy, but also sadness to the story. That's fantastic. I can't wait to read this. Uh, that's great. Uh, we'll just barrel on here. Boy, what, this, once again, this is an emotional roller coaster ride, this particular uh, male hall. Uh, helped, in no doubt, by my manic puppy, who's just bouncing all around. She's not, she's not just sitting patiently. She's bouncing all around because she wants to go outside. <laughs> we'll take care of it, though. Oh. Oh, my. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Uh, wow. Okay, this is this is late getting to me. This came out in July. It's by Noah Wilson Rich, and it's called The Bee: A Natural History. You'll recognize the design. Of you will recognize the design. We got a book called The Dog: A Natural History in just this format from Princeton University Press. Huh. Bees are crucial to the reproduction and diversity of flowering plants that we rely on to survive, including lots of food stock. Uh, the economic contributions of these irreplaceable insects measure in the tens of billions of dollars each year. Yet bees are dying at an alarming rate, threatening food supplies and ecosystems around the world. And this is a natural history, not just of that catastrophe, of course, when you think about bees in 20, 2018, that's all you think about, is that they're disappearing from the world and what that will mean for the world. Uh, but this is a natural history of all the rest of it, too, everything else. Uh, which is fascinating. Bees, uh, the just you could do a book three times the size just on the complexities of bee communication, the way they talk with each other. It contains abstract principles. It contains the future tense. It contains the subjunctive. It's amazing, really. The more you think about it, the more you realize this cannot possibly be entirely instinct, <laughs> uh, one way or another. Uh, this is this is great. That's fantastic. I. Uh, I will read this right away. I once, I, I sorry, I'm a little bit distracted here. Uh, Me sainted Ma uh, had a thing about bees. <laughs> she, she, she didn't like them at all. <laughs> and, uh, and so for years, for the last two decades of her life, whenever I got a book on bees, I would send it to her and, and just to poke fun at her. <laughs> and she, she would she would call me up and say, "What are you wise? That's your mother you're making fun of." <laughs> but then she would display the book on her coffee table for her guests. <laughs> so, uh, so that's going to be a little bittersweet to read. <laughs> anyway, then we've got this last one here, and then I'm afraid I have to go. I have to take the puppy outside. She's not going to last long out there, but she must she must get her way, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so what is this next one? Oh, oh, great! Oh, fantastic! Okay, uh, so this is the this is the paperback release. Uh, this is the paperback release of uh, Seven Stones to Stand or Fall, which has Diana Gabaldon's. This is a, of course set in the world of her Outlander series of books, which are tremendously good fun to read. Uh, but this is not. Uh, this is a collection of Outlander fiction. Um, it yes, collects seven short stories set in the Outlander universe, never before published together, including two original stories, uh, both featuring Jamie Fraser. <laughs> uh, the the uh, authors here, who have we got, who have we got in here? Uh, a whole list of... So the stories are The Custom of the Army, The Space Between, A Plague of Zombies, A Leaf on the Wind of All Hallows, Virgins, a fugitive green, and besieged, uh, and they just, uh... huh? Okay, so what have we got here? Uh, the custom of the army begins with Lord John Gray being shocked by an electric eel and ends with the Battle of Quebec. <laughs> and then comes the space between, where it is revealed that the co that uh, the Comte Saint Germain is not dead. Master Raymond appears, and a widowed young wine dealer escorts a would-be novice to a convent in Paris. A plague of zombies, uh, Lord John unexpectedly becomes military governor of Jamaica when the original governor is gnawed by what probably isn't a giant rat. 
<laughs> little allusion there to Sherlock Holmes for those of you who uh, are going to catch it. Uh, Leaf on the Wind of All Hallows is a moving story of Roger McKenzie's parents during World War II. In versions, Jamie Fraser, age 19, and Ian Murray, age 20, become mercenaries in France, no matter that neither has yet bedded a lass or killed a man, or, one presumes, bedded a man and killed a lass. <laughs> uh, but they're trying. <laughs> uh, Fugitive Green is the story of Lord John's elder brother, Hal, and a 17-year-old rare book dealer with a sideline in theft, forgery, and blackmail. And finally, in Besieged, Lord John learns that his mother is in Havana and that the British Navy is on their way to lay siege to the city. Fantastic. So this is this is Outlander short fiction. I know this came out. I remember when it came out. I never actually got around to it. I read bits and pieces, but I don't think I ever read a full one of the individual stories, much less the whole book, and uh, never viewed it. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad to have the paperback. Uh, but that does, that does uh, continue the theme of this mail hall, which is just a totally unpredictable emotional roller coaster ride. So we have uh, Seven Stones to Stand or Fall, short fiction from Diana Gabaldon, but set in the Outlander world. The Bee, a natural history. Uh, the Fat Kid, a novel. Uh, the Patch by John McPhee, just the, the 33rd John McPhee novel. Uh, in Extremis, uh, The Life and Death of Marie Colvin, a great reporter. Uh, and American Audacity by William Giraldi. Uh, a, a collection of his essays and reviews and whatnot, and then two Martha's Vineyard books that I will you will probably see reviews of them down the line somewhere. Those of you who subscribe to the Vineyard Gazette, and I'm assuming you all do, <laughs> uh, it's like the most beguiling collection of gardening trivia and obituaries that you will ever read. <laughs> uh, the first one is uh, Dear Jack, a love letter from a mother to her dead son, and uh, the next one is Plum Belly, uh, a historical novel that tries to take some of the romanticism out of running away and going to sea. Uh, so just, just fascinating all around. <laughs> so as, so I, we, I will wrap this up for now. I'll take the little Fraulein out for a walk that won't last long. We'll, we'll both come back devastated, and then we'll recuperate. <laughs> she with her chewy toy and frequent naps, and me with tons of writing. Uh, but I'll see you soon, and we'll talk more about books. Uh, thank you, book two.